Hey everyone, um, let's, get, let's get started. So pretty packed room and I was told that the overflow room is also sold out. So I think this is a testament to how exciting this blockchain technology is for everybody and how interesting it is to you guys. Um, so I'm Al Flores, I'm the global segment leader overseeing our blockchain ecosystem here at AWS. And a quick run through the agenda. Theme here is building business ready blockchains with intelligence. And we'll have Lana Kalashnik, one of our global solution architects focused on blockchain at AWS, followed up by Chris Penn, one of the enterprise architects at T-Mobile, who's spearheading the, uh, the next ledger project. Michael Crooks, the managing director at Accenture, who will talk about one of our initiatives we've been collaborating on. And Austin Muhart, uh, lead product development manager at R3, who has been spearheading some of the production deployments. And before I start, I do want to take a quick minute to showcase a video we created to explain some of the benefits and the basic 101s of blockchain. A blockchain is a distributed ledger that is decentralized, distributed, and immutable, enabling automated process workflows. Let's look at an example that demonstrates how this technology works by visiting the voting process. Traditionally, people go to a trusted location to cast their vote. They mark their ballots, which is submitted through a centralized, trusted party. It's a system that's been developed over a long period of time. But what if, instead of mailing a ballot or visiting a voting booth, you vote using a private digital voting token that's linked to your identification when you register to vote? With a distributed ledger, voter registration, verification, collection, and tallying can be automated. And it's trusted by everyone because identities are protected with digital signatures. The ledger is shared across multiple parties, and any changes made must be agreed upon by all. Participants can see the history of the immutable ledger, replacing the traditional previous need for a trusted third party. This is just one example of how blockchain technology can transform a common process. So how can building a blockchain on AWS be beneficial? You can build a superior blockchain solution by using AWS APIs and service integrations. Just like with a database, you can use the wide range of AWS capabilities to perform various functions on a blockchain. For example, technically savvy voters could incorporate AWS analytics services to gain insights to what is taking place on a blockchain. They could also create live streaming visualizations of how each group is voting across a geographic area. Give your blockchain superpowers AWS. Cool. So I hope that explains some of the 101s to blockchain. And to just kind of distill some of these uh, components uh, within blockchain, we know they're highly secure, extremely reliable, immutable, and provides trustworthiness. We've saw in the video, we've heard about it. What are the components that drive those aspects forward? So there's three things that make blockchain unique. We know that there is integrated data store with cryptographic security as part of the integral system. We have a consensus mechanism that allows disparate entities to gain consensus or alignment on a shared piece of information. And a robust state engine that most protocols call smart contracts. We've been canvassing the blockchain, what's called customer demographic for the past few years, and we've really bubbled them up to four use cases that we see com as compelling, ones that take hold of the attributes to blockchain. So decentralized interactions, the ability for, again, disparate entities to be able to transact upon another. And this is usually using specific consensus mechanisms. The list goes on between PBFT, IBFT, RAF, POA, uh, proof of elapsed time, and so forth. And each one has its pros and cons. Provenance of data, so understanding the cradle to grave aspect of your underlying asset or your data. Life cycle, as they also call it. Disintermediation, the ability to have entities transact upon uh, one another without intermediaries or third parties, or as we call it, middlemen. And integrated data management, back to the smart contract aspect where the underlying data store can actually have logic transact on the underlying data. So really quickly, I'm sure you've heard already from Amazon, AWS specifically, that we develop our roadmaps on a customer-obsessed journey. So we listen to feedback and we drive our roadmaps that way. So we have to listen, understand what the, the determinations are gonna look like for our customer journey. And I'm happy to announce that probably about two years ago, we started looking at this space, trying to understand what customers are looking for. 
Now, you may have heard on stage this morning that we've determined what we believe is a good direction forward for customers. And we're proud to announce Amazon, Amazon Managed Blockchain, which is now in preview mode. And it's going to be released with the Hyperledger Fabric Framework. Uh, and then in the next few months, we'll have Ethereum Framework supported also. It's highly scalable and secure. And what we've actually done is we've customized the underlying protocol layer to be far more robust than the open source variants that you can pull off the web. It's fully managed, so you don't have to worry about the underlying nodes. Uh, they'll spin up just, uh, just like you've been accustomed to many of our managed services. And you'll be able to easily analyze your blockchain activities um, by exporting them into our KLDB service. So there's some really interesting integrations that you can take advantage of. And with that, I'll have Lana kick off some of the solution discussions we're having on developing blockchain on AWS. There you go. Right, this, this, okay, it's on. Hey guys, uh, my name is Lana. Uh, we've been talking about blockchain quite a bit this week, so I wanted to um, make it kind of connect more with our partners on how does this um, play into your overall roadmaps. So as far as solutions go, we're working with companies of all sizes. So we're working with brand new protocols that are evolving quite rapidly. And I'm really proud to say that we've launched over 20 solutions in the past year, ranging from AMIs or AMIs, as some prefer to say, to quick starts, to SaaS solutions. And there are a lot of sessions uh, during reInvent this year that I encourage you to see, either recording or in person, on the work we've been doing with partners like R3, who will be joining us on the stage today, Accenture, Kaleido, uh, Cisco, and, and a lot, uh, actually a few other ones. As far as the AWS, AWS startups go, we are investing quite heavily in, um, in actually providing the right support mechanisms to grow startups on top of AWS, and also working with the partners themselves. Uh, this slide shows you a little bit of a glimpse of different types of partners that we've been working with, uh, mostly because blockchain is not one technology, so it's actually a myriad of different technologies that are kind of sharing the same attributes, and they're specialized based on need. So it's kind of like a sliding scale when you're starting to look at your projects uh, between what do you need more? Is trust more important, or is throughput and capabilities? And as you've heard today, we've, um, we are, we've launched Quantum Database, that tackles some of the aspects of transactional throughput and where if you actually need um, a more specialized blockchain solution that is decentralized and there is um, AWS managed blockchain service and also amazing solutions by our partner ecosystem or community. Uh, from the um, AWS value proposition, blockchain doesn't exist in isolation. In fact, it's probably close to 10% of the final solution. So it has to integrate into uh, your mobile applications, um, into your database stores, um, into um, IoT devices if you're looking at supply chain use cases, and uh, a few other ones. So. Very quickly, I want to lay down the foundation for how you should approach building blockchain projects. So whether you're doing this for yourself as a customer or for your, uh, for your customers as a partner. So um, applications don't necessarily have to be decentralized, but they have to be distributed. So um, as with any uh, platform that you're building out, APIs are extremely important, which is where we use API Gateway and a few other ones, to provide a consistent layer of API separation. The blockchain uh, space itself is still bubbling. It's still quite new. So we are seeing hard, uh, hard forks or breaking changes. So this is something that you should be thinking about as you're building platforms. Also something that we've realized is that when you're moving away from public blockchains to towards the private ones, we're seeing increasingly specialized protocols that are splitting off a layer such as consensus, depending on your business needs, and also smart contracts um, and um, other layers. So we have concepts now evolving as unpluggable consensus. Uh, so it means the agreement is, again, a sliding scale based on your needs. Um, and also membership. Membership and uh, event services are extremely important. So this is how you kind of understand what's going on on your chain in a blockchain project. And also this is how you govern your network. So governance is an integral part of decentralization and forming any consortium. So don't assume blockchain is highly available. 
we've done a lot of work with our partners from public chains. Uh, so let's say Ethereum, uh, some of the clients are not necessarily stable, so you should always think of high availability as something that is not inherently um, available in a single node. So for public blockchains, I highly recommend using this framework, which uh, leverages elastic load balancing um, and also a uh, distributed store of data between at least two availability zones to make sure that you can actually run production workloads. Essentially work smarter than harder. And when you're looking to build out a fully hardened solution, as you're moving from POC to production, you will notice stages. So in a POC stage, you're going to be getting to know your technology, which is where AWS um, Ethereum templates, um, a quick start by our partners such as R3 um, or Cisco um, uh, are, are available right now on the marketplace. This is where you should start building out your solutions and getting to know how you will scale out these infrastructures. The more members you're adding to your consortiums, the more important this becomes. So what does this infrastructure look like as, as a whole? Once you're going to the final push to production, uh, we see usually uh, the same uh, characteristics of the final deployments. So do you have your network layer, a core block blockchain platform? Um, and you will notice that here I purposely left this, uh, the consensus to the ledger um, layer agnostic because that should be fitting your use case better. And also integrations. Um, I won't be able to cover all of this, but we will be adding other sessions with more hands-on uh, uh, chalk talks to, uh, during this week to go through how you would actually create a smart contract um, and add members to your consortium. So we'll dig in deeper. Something that I want you to think about as you're building out these platforms is also data governance and provenance. So not everything needs to go in the ledger because inherently it's immutable. So everything that you're writing to the ledger will stay there forever. So that means for, uh, for uh, PI data or or anything that could be regulated, you have to think quite heavily as to should you store this on the ledger or not, and also about the size of the files that you're storing. Again, you can't erase it by design uh, of the mutability and the linking of blocks themselves. So once it's there, uh, you can't trim it or bring down the ledger size. So for that, we're seeing um, S3 used quite heavily for syncing off-chain data and just storing larger uh, file sizes. And also, we're not forgetting about our uh, public blockchain. So we are heavily um, investing in these secure infrastructure frameworks that are leveraging um, our new services, uh, such as GuardDuty um, and Cloud HSM integrations to provide secure signing and encryption services. Um, and this becomes increasingly important as we're moving away from proof of work networks and moving closer to proof of stake or proof of authority, where you don't have the same burden uh, to prove to forge data in, in the previous block, so you have to architect around it. And this is when uh, integrations with the security services are becoming um, incredibly important. So this is not uh, something that is uh, the art of possible. This is something that we've built and tried out with uh, multiple partners um, in our community. Uh, this is exactly what we do um, uh, day in and day out. So if you're curious about how would you be able to integrate blockchain into your existing partner solutions or for your customers, please reach out and we'll be happy to see how we can apply the same paradigm to your projects. And with that, I'm going to hand this over back to Al. Awesome. Great work, Lana. So Lana's been pretty busy building out these frameworks, these best practices, and these approaches, or you know, methodologies um, over the past few years. So these are really some, some uh, approaches that we take to heart on how you should uh, design blockchain solutions. And to that point before, you know, our goal really is to build a comprehensive ecosystem of partners, solutions, joint offerings. So we're looking to collaborate with some advanced tier partners. And one of those collaborations um, we'll talk more about with, with Accenture is the Blockchain Express initiative. So we've been spearheading this, this initiative over the past few months. And the idea is how do we melt away the complexities for delivering solutions that are blockchain? Um, typically speaking, in enterprise space, they're either extremely complex, um, very difficult to undergo, or the investments are quite significant. So we've actually done this um, joint effort where we believe we'll be able to uh, lower the barriers to entry to actually deploy these blockchain solutions. And I'll let Accenture come up here in a little bit to uh, talk more about this. And lastly, just to go back to the theme, the idea here is building blockchains with intelligence. So this is not just technology, like, like, uh, like Lana was saying. This is a lot more to that. And this is why there's been so many failures in this space. So there's more than just the architecture, more than just the security. There's an organizational mindset, a transformational mindset that has to go 
uh, in order to make this successful. And so this is what the theme is here. How do we move blockchains to production? How do we bring them, ma make them valuable for business? Uh, and so we'll talk about those with three partners, T-Mobile, Accenture, and R3. And with that being said, I'll have uh, Chris Fenton kick off the conversation he's doing with uh, Next Ledger. Great, thanks Al, appreciate it. Um, and, and thanks Lana for the introduction and getting us started. So my name's Chris Banton, I'm a senior architect with T-Mobile and <clears throat> I, uh, I work in our cloud center of excellence. And you know, I just want to take a quick step back from talking about blockchain to show you a little bit about what we've been doing. You know, I'll mention technology transformation, how that's an important part of delivering blockchain solutions, and it really is important in your organize in your organization to understand what it takes to deliver an enterprise architecture or you know an architecture that's appropriate to your business, and not just deliver a blockchain application. So when we look at building solutions to make our business better, we you know as with any decision for a business, look at the needs and evaluate how we can put an application in there to uniquely solve those. And we've been doing that with a lot of the technologies you see on the board over the last several years at T-Mobile. And excitingly, we've now turned around and started open sourcing those technologies. So from our Jazz serverless platform to what was known as Pac-Man, we've now rebranded as PacBot. It's a policy as code uh, tool set that allows you to gain deeper understanding into how your cloud platform is performing what's going on there and perform automated remediations around that stuff. So technology transformation and um, <clears throat> Delivering technologies to help your business move is something that T-Mobile has really embraced. You know, I want to invite you all to think a little bit differently about T-Mobile. Think about us as a technology producer, not just a technology consumer. That's something that we really believe in. Another solution that I'm specifically going to talk about today is Next Directory. This is a blockchain application. <clears throat> So how does this fit into our enterprise and our business, and how does this make us more efficient and better able to deliver solutions to you guys? Well, I stood up here last year with Al and others and launched the POC that we called HyperDirectory. HyperDirectory was a proof of concept for us to prove out that we could layer a complex enterprise architecture, including NoSQL databases, API layers, and S3 UIs with a blockchain application. You know, Lana really hit it on the head. It's, blockchain might be 10% of the architecture of this application. Now it's a critical 10% that provides unique characteristics to the application at the end of the day, but it is not by any means the entirety of this application. So where have we come since then? What are we doing here and how has the last year played out? And why? Why are we using blockchains? That's a really important question. As we focus on that question, there are three key points that I found that I believe are important. One, for us, in this specific application, is that audit is hard. I don't know how many of you are in highly compliant audited organizations now. In telecom, that's something that we live with every day. We've got Sarbanes-Oxley and PCI DSS and a broad range of other compliance initiatives that, we're, uh, that we participate in. And it's both hard and complex to do that. With blockchain and the, the ability to immutably write transactions and have those transactions be non-repudiatable, it gives us a unique set of characteristics that we can then apply into an architecture to help solve some of those problems around audit. The next is the who's watching the watchers. This is that classic kind of problem in, in audited environments where, okay, so we've got this application and it manages identity for our users, <clears throat> excuse me, but um, how, how do we prove that you know, we're doing a good job of managing that environment? Well, okay, we've got logging. Logging and we log everything that happens and so we can those sh then show our auditors that this is working right. Well, how do we prove those logs haven't been tampered with? All right, great, we've got an answer there too. There's change management. So we wrap some change management around that application, the logging, and, and then we're able to prove that the logs haven't been tampered with as well. Okay, so how do we prove that the, right? So that problem kind of goes on and on. You can kick that can down the road, but this who's watching the watchers problem is short-circuited with a blockchain when we're able to prove the immutability of data and the non-repudiatability of transactions. We no longer have to worry about that. And finally, software should be wonderful to use. Now, I don't know how many of you interface with identity and access management tools, but that does not elicit in me a sense of wonder. 
But that's something that we firmly believe at T-Mobile, in our cloud center of excellence and in our business, that software should be wonderful to use. We believe in empowering solutions that make your job and your life easier. And that's a big part of what we wanted to build with, as we took that POC forward. So this architecture, I promise I didn't collaborate with Landon and the AWS team, but you know, this architecture diagram looks fairly similar to what she presented, right? We've got an S3 UI sitting on top of an API layer that runs on an EC host. Um, we've got a database layer. In our case, that's a NoSQL database. It's something that allows us to perform high-speed read transactions and an appropriate level of write to interface with our blockchain for the given use case. It's important to understand when you develop an architecture for a blockchain application, as with any enterprise application, what the problem is you're trying to solve, what the kind of transaction data you're going to be working with, how that's going to fit within your overall business. We correlate the traits that we achieve with this application with the capabilities of the blockchain, and then we layer that into the architectural stack, right? That immutability and non-repudiatability are critical for us in this so that we can then improve the auditing and governance around managing identity information. So this is a far cry from that POC user experience that you saw. This is the wonderful application that we are rolling into production in very short order. This is something that includes a conversational user experience where you could, and we're working now on integrating with Alexa or providing opportunities to um, interact with the software that actually makes your job easier to do. You know, identity management doesn't start when you request to a resource. It starts when you realize that you need to do something you can't. And your software should be intelligent. Your blockchain should be intelligent and help you solve those problems. So we have things like recommendation engines that help get us there. There's a lot more that goes into this that we're not going to have time to cover today, but we're really excited about it. The next identity platform and next directory is about requesting, approving, and auditing access to your identity information. It's an intelligent identity management solution that's built on Hyperledger Sawtooth, and it's open source. It's not just open source in that you know an enterprise takes some software and, and dumps it out in the public and says, hey, you guys, you can go use it now. It's open source in that every commit is public. You can go track that. You can track our backlog. You can track the conversations between our developers in a public forum. Heck, you could even join our stand-up every day. This is an extremely public project, so it's important to us to bring blockchain forward, and not just blockchain applications, but the process of developing blockchain. And that's why we're here with the team talking about this. AWS as a platform for us is, is really important and critical. We've worked with Intel and AWS and others to build this out, and we leverage things like EC2, um, S3, and IAM and AWS via federated directories to integrate with Next. And their platform is, well, wonderful. That's one of the things that we like about using it. And it gives us the capability now with new things like QDBS to potentially replace some of those components, the architectural stack, and, and bring this forward into a new generation and provide solutions that can help our business and yours solve problems in new and unique ways. Now, really quickly, let's be clear. All dates are estimates. We're working on this. We use an agile process. You can track our sprints. Like I said, it's open source. Feel free to engage. Be a part of that. But we are anticipating launching a production parallel version internally of this application at T-Mobile this year. And we'll anticipate bringing that into production in a full mode in the next quarter of 2019. And that's a really exciting place to be, bringing production blockchain applications into our business and improving the capability and delivering something that's wonderful to use. Thank you. Cool. Oh, good job, Chris. Thanks. All right, so, um, and I agree with uh, Chris. Highly recommend checking out the GitHub repo. It's all open source, all available. If you guys are serious about this, this technology, they're a great example of, of a customer using this. Uh, and next would be Accenture, with Michael, War Michael Ward of here. Dickinson, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your time. My name is Michael Crooks. I'm with Accenture. I'm a managing director. I lead a number of our innovation initiatives for uh, Accenture. And so one of the key initiatives that I'm leading right now is a partnership that we have with AWS around this thing called Blockchain Express. So I'm going to talk to you about that today. I'm going to do something really quick, though, to make sure everyone's awake. 
Can everyone who's done some sort of blockchain project or has been venturing into blockchain POCs, just raise your hand, please. Holy cow, that's pretty good. Now, all those who raise your hand, no, keep it up. Clap. I want an applause because, guys, you're starting on an adventure. I'm serious. Clap. This is awesome. Usually when I ask that question, the room has like three or four people, and most folks aren't. I'm just really excited to see folks are starting to move along. And this, this supports part of what's taking place right now with us and what we've realized. You know, when you start thinking about the whole journey around blockchain and what's been taking place, you know, initially the challenges that were taking place, the inhibitors that we were all experiencing, I'm sure you're, these are familiar, you know, and understanding what blockchain is. You know, I remember having, you know, one of those phone calls with a CIO who asked me, you know, why is my IT organization trying to go and form a cryptocurrency? I was like, uh, no, that's not quite what's going on with blockchain. So getting that understanding across the executive leadership to understand how blockchain is going to help them to go and drive various types of efficiencies, and being able to go and drive new aspects of use cases for everything related to identity, to supply chain, was really a key thing. So now I think that baseline understanding is, is, is now understood around blockchain. And then when you start thinking about speed and scale, there was quite a bit of misunderstanding that was taking place, right? You know, previously folks would say that, you know, it doesn't, doesn't scale, it doesn't, there's no speed behind blockchain. Decentralized ledger technologies just can't perform. But that misunderstanding that took place, you know, if you take a look at it now, you know, people have come around and understood that some of that was by design. It's not really about a limitation of the technology itself. And as we continue to evolve the technology itself, we only see more and more improvement in performance. So that too is becoming more of a myth. And then finally, the security pieces. A lot of organizations, you know, once again, heard what was taking place in the media around, you know, different types of vulnerabilities that took place when, in fact, it wasn't the blockchain, it was really wallets. So there's a lot of misunderstandings that have been really, I think, taken care of for the most part. And when you take a look at, you know, the gains that have taken place between people are now realizing there is a difference between blockchain and Bitcoin. <laughs> and, you know, you have things like the ASX that's going live in 2021, which is the Australian Stock Exchange. Pretty awesome. And then at the same time, you know, finally folks realizing that breaches aren't happening on the chain. That I, can dare, I can clearly say technology is winning, hence the applause. Technology is winning. This is great. But still at the same time, just like many journeys that take place with innovative technologies, adoption is somewhat slow. Right? And why is that? Well, let's take a look at it. Okay. Um, at Accenture and with a number of other research firms, we took a deep dive into the market. We took a look at a number of the C-suite executives, had great conversations. We started realizing things such as, you know, leadership isn't really understanding the applicability of blockchain. They understand that the technology is there, they agree it works, but they don't really understand how to use it in their enterprise quite as yet. And at the same time, some organizations are saying, you know what, we think this is important, but not really right now. We're not quite sure we want to go on that journey. We want to be a fast follower. And then some organizations have CIOs that are clearly just saying, look, I have high, higher priority initiatives and they don't want to risk it quite yet. And they're deciding that they're saying to themselves that there's a difference between going on the journey related to my ERP, going on a journey related to supply chain, but not realizing that blockchain could be part of that journey. And then some organizations just plainly don't understand how to operationalize it within their enterprise. And that's across multiple industries, from transportation to media and entertainment, the story goes on and on and on. So the challenge these days is what I've noticed and what our organization has noticed isn't so much about the technology anymore. We have a belief in the technology. The real challenge is how to operationalize it. And that's where our partnership with AWS comes in and our offering that is known as Blockchain Express comes in. Which what we're really focusing on is looking at organizations and saying transformationally what takes place in the enterprise. Not even talking about consortia, just looking at your enterprise, understanding what takes place from the business function standpoints, what's changing in your processes, what's happening related to your portfolio, your various initiatives, what are you doing around people and talent, and what happens in the culture, because that's another key aspect of adoption. All of those key dimensions, we're engaging and we're working very closely with AWS to build a program which we have a set of accelerators in which we bring in our various clients into our liquid studios and then we move them through a four to five week initiative in which they're able to gain a complete understanding of the technology, an understanding of what's the value prop for their organization, what does it mean to operationalize and what is the transformational aspects that take place in their company and also technological assets as an outcome, not a proof of concept as an outcome, a proof of value, something you can latch on to, and you can move forward and continue to move toward production. 
And you know, when we, when we created this offering, we had a great understanding that every organization has a different phase of where they are in their maturity. You know, some organizations are at the learn the experience, right? I'm trying to really get an understanding of what this is all about. Does, is it meaningful to my organization? I love what was going through with uh, T-Mobile, how they went through that journey of understanding what is the business problem, then from there understanding what's the value problem, and then putting it toward what is the solution. And it's a part of an overall ecosystem of solutions and capabilities they're bringing to the table. And then moving from there, establishing what is the strategy? You know, how do I move this forward with my enterprise? What's the strategic advantage I can bring to the market? And then finally, building and implementing and realizing that this is no longer a widget or a shiny object, but rather something that's transformationally changing for their organization, shifting them from being the disrupted to being the disruptors in their markets. That's what this program's about. So once again, everything's about value. Technology is wonderful, but if you can't prove value, then it's all for naught. This is just a quick look at what the Blockchain Express offering um, available with AWS is. The ones we have our five-week engagements that we do, in which we do this whole discovery, establishment of a narrative, the use cases that we're going to go and latch on to as anchor points, establishing what's the actual value you're going to realize in your organization, helping you design that operating model as a baseline, and then from there moving forward with a technology aligns with that operating model so you can realize value along with the realization of what the technology can bring to the table. So anyway, that, you know, we're really excited to pilot this with AWS, really happy to be partners with them and looking forward to engaging with other enterprise customers on this venture as well. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. Five, man. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Crooks there. Too many emails, too many Michaels, so I got confused there. But <laughs> So uh, if we want to go on with Austin Muhar from R3. Right. All right. Hi, folks. I'm here with R3 and uh, as a solutions engineer for Corda. So we are a blockchain platform company. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of us, I'll do a little bit of a dive back into where we come from and what we're all about. Oops. Excellent. And really dive into actually some of our production use cases because we're seeing a lot of our customers go live into AWS with Corda as the blockchain platform of their choice. So we're about four years old at this point. Corda itself actually just celebrated its third birthday in November this year. So we're three years old from our first GitHub commit. And we founded Corda because something, we needed something different, right? In the market at that time, a lot of the products out there were actually public cryptocurrencies. And our target customer base is not looking to use cryptocurrency at this point, right? They're big institutions, right? They're the largest financial institutions in the world, insurance companies, healthcare organizations, et cetera. And they need something as much, which is much more private, right? So for the enterprise, the number one feature beyond security is privacy. And so this is a blockchain founded for the enterprise from the ground up with privacy as the number one feature. In order to facilitate that, we needed a very different communication model than you might be accustomed to with a lot of blockchain solutions that exist today. And that is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, right? So instead of a gossip-driven network where all peers know everything at all times, you actually have a peer-to-peer -peer network where only the people involved in a transaction are actually aware of what's going on. And because we've made this decision from the ground up, it's fundamentally changed the way in which information is shared and does it in a way which really works for the largest enterprises in the world. Additionally, instead of an anonymous identities, we're actually looking at fully qualified public identities for, so you're communicating with a well-established, well-known partner. So, built from the enterprise from the ground up, and privacy, right? So these are the main things you're seeing. As well as on the right, we also built using existing tool sets. So instead of reinventing the wheel, we're using Java. So the JVM from the ground up. Again, these are tool sets that already exist out there. There's millions of Java developers who can lean on these toolkits. For databases, we're using JDBC. So that's SQL database that you might be accustomed to, right? SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres, et cetera. Additionally, this is a globally ne global network, so you're going to be able to interact between industries across networks uh, with ease in, uh, across different asset classes which were previously not able to be exchanged. 
So we've been on this journey for a little while, and you've seen a lot of slides like this, and really excitingly, we're getting to the right-hand side of this, right? We're actually going to production, we're deploying nodes, we're actually going to live exchanges for permanent immutable data and permanent transactions. So what I'll talk to you about today is a few of those, and a lot of our customers are choosing AWS, right? AWS provides ex excellent toolkits. You're gonna be using EC2, S3, EFS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and I'll kind of walk through a couple of those use cases and really what those look like. Um, and additionally, we also have a quick start template, which is available in the AWS Marketplace. So if you want to give Corda Enterprise a try, that's out there and available for the masses. So first of all, we'll look at Tradewind. And this is a, a startup which is built using Corda, which is commodity or tokenizing gold, right? So this is a physical asset. This is something which is classically hard to get your hands on. But what is created here is an application which allows gold traders to actually exchange gold in a marketplace with ease. And so this is going live to reduce our cost and friction, right? Well, the number one feature that a lot of these institutions are all dealing with, just like with what T-Mobile's dealing with, right? Auditing is hard. And this solves auditing because you're getting a private blockchain in order to do these exchanges with immutable transactions, allowing you to actually look back historically and see what occurred. Now, from a technical perspective, um, it looks fairly much like a classic three-tier architecture, right? In the end, this is middleware. Right? Corda sits in the middle in order to facilitate transactions between classic layers. So you have a UI, you have a web server, and you still have a database, and Corda sits between your web server and your database in order to facilitate the digital signatures, the identity, the consensus, and all those ledger pieces prior to saving to a classic database that you may be accustomed to using. Right? So you'll see a load balancer in front, I'll talk more about that in a couple minutes, an EC2 instance in the middle to do all of your compute, and a classic RDS instance on the back end to store your actual data. And in front, you still have classic REST APIs, but again, that's a little bit outside the scope of even the ledger here. And this really is similar to what you've seen, right? This is, you're seeing a very consistent architecture paradigm here in order to get these ledger services into production. Another use case that we have in production on AWS is Guild One. So this is a Canadian use on oil for royalty contracts. So again, very enterprise focused, high regulation, legal, a lot of reconciliation, but what this is providing is, is a way to reconcile these contracts on Ledger, right? You can put this into smart contracts on Corda in order to facilitate the exchange and the payments of these royalty, ledger, or royalty contracts on a distributed Ledger. From an architecture perspective, this looks fairly similar, right? V very much an EC2. Um, and just classic nodes, classic EFS, classic elastic load balancing, and with the ledger piece built on Corda sitting in the middle. Another really exciting use case for us is with Jumalto. And this is a, really a big use case for blockchain in general, is identity. There's two big utilities that we believe will take place on distributed ledgers, and that is identity and cash. And those are really the, 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 the oil of the system, right? That's gonna keep everything moving from transaction to transaction. And so Jamalto is building a decentralized identity on Corda, which will allow for the facilitation of your identity under, but under your control for a change, right? You'll establish your identity on their ledger and be able to share it with other institutions as you desire, right? It gives you control over your identity instead of being locked into a single centralized provider. And then we also were looking at trade finance. So trade IX is another startup building on Corda. And here you're seeing a slightly different paradigm. This is a slightly different architecture, which also Lana hinted at in her conversation, which is that you need to keep these things highly available. That you can't just have a single point of failure in any one of these systems. So with Corda Enterprise, you have high availability built into the system. So in the middle there, you have an elastic load balance, which talks to two different enterprise nodes. And one, this is a hot cold setup, right? So one of these nodes is running. In the event of failure, it falls over to the cold node, and that node will spin up and begin processing as if nothing ever happens, right? With a decentralized system, you need something which is very asynchronous. So this is a really fault tolerant, highly asynchronous decentralized system. Behind the scenes, you also need an elastic file storage because there still have to have redundant storage for saving of operational tasks and files, et cetera. Lastly, another really important dis uh, differentiator here is that when we're going to clients, they, need, they have a lot of security, right? There's these IT teams, ops teams, et cetera, and they have very strict rules, and they've been around for a long time, and they're all here to say no. So we have to be able to overcome no's, and the way that we do that is by with the Corda Firewall, is that we can approach a team and say that instead of having to, uh, with a peer-to-peer -peer network, right, you actually need to open up a lot of ports. 
But instead of having to do that, we established the Core to Firewall, which means that you only have to open up one inbound port in order to access your Core to Node. So this is effectively a reverse proxy, which will keep things available, um, such that you only have to do things once with the IT security teams. And what this does is that you'll have a node that sits inside of your DMZ, and within that, it will actually terminate the TLS connection such that you only pull into your sensitive production data center the messages that you truly need. So this creates a very secure stopping point for IT firms, and that makes them quite happy, and much, it's much easier to deploy Corda than other solutions. Lastly, here's kind of a full architecture diagram. This is actually straight from our documentation. There's way too much to explain here. So if you have questions, you can always come up and ask afterwards. Um, but this is really what we're doing. This is what we're deploying into AWS with all of our partners and startups and firms and our membership base. Um, you can visit us at r3.com slash quarta-enterprise. Uh, we also have quick starts up in the AWS marketplace. And we're also in the quad at ARIA. So if you have questions, feel free to come up and ask. Uh, I'll be here all week so I can answer anything you might be curious to know about Quarta. Cool. Thank you.